Hey, turn with me this morning real quickly to 1 Samuel chapter 18. I will say this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use my initial text out of the Message Bible. I normally don't uh, use that. Uh, I like it. It's okay. It's a, it's a translation or it's a paraphrase. And um, sometimes it gives some, some deeper understanding. Um, you may not have, I don't know if you carry the Message Bible with you or not, or maybe you can go on your, your smartphone. And what I meant by smartphone is Android. <laughs> anyway. Uh, so, uh, you've got a friend in us. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 1. By the time David had finished reporting to Saul. Now, what's happened in chapter 17 of 1 Samuel is David has killed Goliath. Yes. With a slingshot. Foo! And kills him. Dead. Cuts off his head. And so at the end of it, Saul says, who are you? And he says, I'm, I'm the son of your servant, Jesse. And uh, from the city of Bethlehem, my name is David. And it says right here in verse 18, or verse 1 of uh, chapter 18, it says, by the time David had finished reporting all these things to Saul, Jonathan, and Jonathan was Saul, uh, Saul's oldest son. Jonathan was deeply impressed with David. An immediate bond was forged between them. He became totally committed to David. From that point on, he would be David's number one advocate and friend. Saul received David to, into his own household that day, no more to return to a home of his father. Jonathan, out of his deep love for David, made a covenant with him. He formalized it with, a, with solemn gifts, his royal robe and weapons, armor, sword, bow, and belt. Father, I just ask that you would speak to our hearts today in your precious name. Amen. Um, we see this story, and in fact, we can go in Psalm, first Psalms 18, 19, 20, 23, and, and even into 24, and we can see the story of, of Jonathan and Saul. And as we talk just for a few moments this morning on relationships, specifically on friendships, I want to point out their friendship. Some of the characteristics of their friendship, some characteristics of their life. And then I want us to look at it in regards to us and, and how, how we would respond and how we should respond. Um, there was a preacher who was dying. He was on his deathbed. So he asked his wife. There was, happened to be a, a lawyer and a banker that was in his church. He didn't always get along with them all that well. In fact, a lot of times if you were to ask the banker or the uh, lawyer if the pastor liked them, they would say no, and it's because they always felt like that he was preaching at them about being greedy or, or being, uh, covetous, uh, being, uh, being covetousness um, or uh, just different things about their own lifestyle. So they'd feel, they'll feel, they felt convicted because they felt convicted. They didn't think this pastor liked them. But on his deathbed, he calls for them. And so they come in, and one ends up sitting on his right side, and the other one sits on his left, and he just, they just, he just sits there and holds their hands. Just, and, and at first, it's kind of like, well, we just feel so special and so recognized that the pastor wants us here. <laughs> and so um, they sat there, and then it became a little bit uncomfortable. Guys holding hands always becomes uncomfortable, <laughs> or a lot of times it does, I guess. And so they're sitting there, and finally the, the banker looks at the pastor and says, Pastor, so why, we appreciate you allowing us to be here in this moment. It's, it's really awesome for us, but why have you called us here? And the pastor just said, you know, when Jesus died on the cross, he died between two thieves, and I've chosen to do the same myself. Anyway, that's bad. If we have any bankers or lawyers, I really don't mean that. I'm just reading that as a story, and so relationships though right we all need relationships we all need we all need a good doctor and we all need a good banker um we all need some of us may need good lawyers too <laughs> um you know we need a good mechanic they're sometimes difficult to find and i'm not somebody that does a good job i'm talking about somebody that does a good job and it's fair and honest and you know they're, oh you need all this new stuff oh really well i just put that on the other day why do I need it new again? Oh, oh, oh we didn't see that. You know, and, and, and it happens in every, in every area, uh, in every area um, of professionals. I'm not just trying to pick on them, but, you know, we all need these things. And so there's four relationships that we all need. 
One of those relationships is this, and the greatest one is this, our relationship with Jesus Christ. That, listen, the greatest decision you'll ever make is who is Jesus Christ in your life. Listen, the Bible says that one day every tongue will confess and every knee shall bow. One day they're going to confess that he is God, that he is Lord. They're not going to say, well, we decided to do it this way and we decided to do it that way and we thought well, if we were just nice enough. Jesus said, I am the only way. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. And so this, this morning as we look at this, the number one relationship that you and I need is a relationship with Christ. And I, let, me, let me just take it a little bit step further than that because a lot of times we think, well, well, when I was five years old, I went down and I shook the pastor's hand or I said, and that's wonderful, but that's not the end of that relationship. When a woman gives birth and they go, oh, well, I gave birth, I guess that's it. No, it's not. That's the beginning, right? And you mamas that are here this morning, you fully understand that because you're like, you'll never sleep again. It'll, and you do eventually sleep. Just kick them out of the house and you'll go to sleep. <laughs> no, no, I'm playing. And that's not true either. But the point is, is listen, that's not, the, that's not the end. So when you come to salvation, when you raise your hand and say, I believe in Christ, that's not the end of it. That's just the beginning of, the, of your walk. Yes. But the greatest relationship that you and I need is a relationship with Christ. Yes. And the second one that I would look at and say this morning is the second I don't know if it's the greatest, the second greatest relationship, but another relationship that you and I both need. We need a church family. Some people, do you have to be a Christian to go to church? No, you don't have to be a Christian to go to church. There's truth in that. But it's God's idea and God's plan, the church. And he puts it in our lives not to be some other obligation. He doesn't put it in our lives just to be something else to do. He puts it in our lives so that it will be a benefit to us. But listen, he puts it in our lives not only to be a benefit to us, but that we'd be a benefit to the world. See, church is God's idea. It's not man's idea. Another thought on this is that the church is a part of God's plan to redeem the world. Do you realize that God desires to use his church? To show people to Christ. He doesn't have to use us. That's his plan. That's his desire to use us. The reason we need a church family, we can look at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not giving up, give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. The day that it's talking about is talking about the return of Christ. Let me just tell you something. You don't have to be a, a biblical scholar or theologian to read the end of the book and read recognize we're there we're just moments away from stepping into eternity whether in this life or the or the lord would come back for his church we're a breath away but the the idea is is that it says as as we see that day approaching we need we need each other more and more we need to challenge each other more and more, and we need to encourage each other more and more. Listen, I, please understand me. I realize the church isn't perfect. You know what I know of that? Because you're here. Me too. The church isn't perfect. They're not always going to do everything right. Not any more than you do everything right. Well, I wish the pastor would do da 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 And then, well, let's start thinking about how good of a church member you are. da 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 now, are we going to judge each other about that? No, we don't do that, but we need each other. We need our, so our greatest relationship we need is Jesus Christ. Amen. Listen, you can forget the rest of these, but we're not. You can forget everything else. This is the greatest relationship that you're going to be held accountable for when you stand before the Lord. But one of the things that will help us in that walk in our, in our Christian faith is our church family. And then I use the text this morning in 1 Samuel chapter 18 and it gives the story of Jonathan and David. Here's the significance of this relationship and here's the significance of what David did or what uh, Jonathan did for David. Jonathan was the next in line to be the king. If Saul died or Saul retired, whatever the situation would be, 
Jonathan would become the king. But what Jonathan did when he made a covenant with David, he took off his right to be the heir and placed it on David. In fact, if you were to continue to read the story later on, um, Jonathan says to David, you are the next in line. He recognized it. He saw it with spirit. He wasn't being greedy or worried about, well, he's going to take my position. He recognized that the anointing and the kingship was already on David. And yet it says that whenever he would begin telling the, the things to Saul of who he was, that something in Jonathan's heart bound his heart, bound his heart in love with David. Here's someone, and if you, if you continue to read on, if you were to read the, the, the accounts of this, we recognize that Saul becomes jealous of David. He becomes jealous because of, of all the things that, that David would do, all the people that he would conquer, all the, all the, the uh, magnificent things that David would do and get credit for, and Saul would begin to hate him for it. And throughout um, the, Saul's life, he would begin to try to destroy David and kill David. But I look at this and I said that we have four um, relationships that we need and one is in Christ and the second one is the church. But then the next thing we need is we need a true friend. We have a lot of acquaintances and that's fine. Hey, listen, even in the church we have a lot of times we have a lot of acquaintances and they may not be true friends. They may be friends and they may be real friends. They may, be, uh, they may love us and they may protect us and all those things. But I'm talking about a true friend, a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And so this morning as we talk about, you've got a friend. The reason we brought in Woody and, and, uh, and uh, Buzz, they're friends. That's why. Now the reason we did that was just a thought, hey, listen, what, what, what's something that would portray not only the students, but, but even adults? What would portray? Well, we recognize them as friends. Oh, they may not be spiritual friends. They may just be cartoon friends. I understand that. But how many times have we watched that and go, oh, I wish they had a friend like that? <laughs> They'd light the dynamite on my back so it would shoot me down the road. No. Bernard Meltzer said this, a true friend is someone who thinks you are a good egg, even though he knows that you are slightly cracked. So, a true friend. So in looking at the life of Jonathan and David, here's some things that I believe what true friendship would look like and looks like in, on our in, in our lives and should look like in our lives. The first thing and, and is, is that there was, there, we, we don't specifically, maybe not understand this, but you, if you've got a true friend, you know exactly what this is, that, they, that there was a love that they had for each other. You mean a guy can love a guy? Yeah, a guy can love a guy and it not be silly or weird or any of those things because what happens is it's not, it's not love that the world portrays, it's the love of God that yeah. impacted their hearts and, Connected their hearts together. And so, listen, if you're going to have a true friend, they've got to love you. Amen. And they're going to love you with all of your warts and everything. They're going to love you. Love covers a multitude of sin. Amen. And Jonathan and David loved one another. But we would recognize this out of Proverbs 17, 17. A friend loves at all times. Another thing that we would recognize from their life is that they were loyal to one another. Even when David would begin to t tell to Jonathan, your dad is trying to kill me. <laughs> and instead of Saul getting, I mean, instead of Jonathan getting upset, and, going, oh, and he does, he says, oh, my dad's not like that. And he goes, yeah, you watch. You watch, this is what's going to happen. And if this has happened, he's going to kill me. And if this happens, then I'll, I'll come back and everything will be okay. And as, as exactly like David said, if he responds this way, that means he's trying to kill me. And he responded exactly that way. But Jonathan didn't give him up and say, hey, dad, he's out in the field. Why don't you send the people to go? Why don't you send some of your soldiers to go get him? But he was loyal. He was committed to him. He was devoted. In fact, if you were to continue to read um, the passages in 1 Samuel 18 and 19, it would even begin to discuss it that they were committed and loyal to one another. Jonathan, out of his deep love for David, made covenant with him. Another thing that we see about a true friendship is it protects. 
Jonathan protected David on more than one occasion and even protected him from his father and even protected him knowing that he wasn't going to be the king. He protected him because he recognized what was on David's life. Listen, you and I, if we're going to have our true, true friendships, we protect each other. I don't have to run around and say, well, you know Joshua, Joshua this and Joshua that. No, because I have, I'm, I have, I'm in relationship with him. I'm a true friend of his. I don't need to go around and tell everybody else all of the things that are going on in Josh's life. I'm protecting him. Amen. For one, it's not any of your business. Two, as the Lord's working on him and working through him, he doesn't need somebody else throwing rocks at him. Then He's already trying to fight off what the enemy's wanting to do. And maybe what Crystal's trying to do to get him right. No, but the true, we protect each other. We don't have to go around saying, well, oh, Pastor Scott, do you know that they did this? Learn to zip it. See, we... <laughs> We don't have a problem where Paul would tell, tell us as the church, speak the truth. We don't have a problem with that part. But that's not where it ended. It said, speak the truth in love. <laughs> Can I tell you something? If by you saying something and it's going to get somebody else either embarrassed or, or tell on them and you feel good about it, then shut your mouth because that's not in love. I'm being, I, I'm being nice. I put a smile on when I say that. Shut your mouth. <laughs> now, I'm not trying to be mean, but I'm saying, we walk around saying, well, we love these people. We love, and, and then you, we'll go behind their back to when they're not around and say, hey, did you know that Josh did this? And I'm picking on Josh this morning because he hadn't been here for a few weeks, so I'm going to just pick on him today. But the point is, right? We do those things and we say, yeah, but I love God. And I love them. And yet the truth is, is you won't protect them even though you think you have something on them. I would say this, be careful lest you fall. Jesus would say, by the same measure that you give, it'll be returned to you. So if you don't want all your dirty laundry told, then won't you keep everybody else dirty laundry quiet? Now, that, that, that doesn't mean that, oh, well, if they live in sin, then we're not supposed to. That's not what I'm, don't, don't take it to that far extreme. But listen, there's times that whenever we, do, when we deal with situations that we, we don't have to go tell everybody what's going on. You and that person need to sit down and talk about it and let that be it. You don't have to run around, well, I went and talked to them because they're acting da 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 da. Well, you just did what, <laughs> you didn't protect them. So a, a true friendship has love and loyalty and protects. Listen, it also encourages and strengthens. I don't know about you, but I, I'll just be real honest. I, the last um, 20 days, actually about 26 days, have been a kick in the pants. Not in a good way. Well, I should say like a kick in the stomach. <laughs> Maybe better than a kick in the stomach. You're just like, gee, Really? Jesus, really? <laughs> but you know what a good friend does? They come and encourage you. They'll let you sit there and go, gloom, despair, right? But what do they do? They come alongside you and say, hey, this is not, this isn't it. This isn't the end. It isn't over. It is well. And they encourage and they strengthen and they push and they sometimes have to pull and sometimes they have to let you cry. It's like, oh, it's going to be okay. But what, what do you do? We, we encourage and we strengthen one another because that's what true friendship is. Amen. So the characteristics that we see is that they love and they're loyal and they protect and they encourage and strengthen. And how many of you, hey, how many of us need somebody just to encourage us from time to time? Somebody just to be there to say, hey, listen, it's okay. Not to sit there and be critical. Not to sit there, well, you need to get right with Jesus. I know I need to get right with Jesus, but right now I'm having problems with that. I think something else that we see from their lives, and I think there's a place that a true friend holds us accountable. That when we get over in that gloom and despair, 
that they don't let us just sit there and wallow in it. And then we don't dive in with them. Yeah, I know what you mean. Scoot over. <laughs> no, man. We hold each other accountable. We say, no, 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 no. That's the lie of the enemy. And we're not going to jump off in that, in that pit. We've been in that pit before. You remember when we were in that pit and it took us everything to get out of it? We don't want to go back in that pit again. And they hold us accountable. They say, hey, listen, you're not living right. And they're not saying that to you to be mean to you. They're not saying that to you so everybody else will know. They'll come to you and say, hey, listen, you, can I encourage you? Walk in faith. Man, you need, to, you need to spend more time with the Lord. You need to be... Because yeah. we're holding each other accountable because that's what true relationships or true friendships should be all about. See, I, I recognize that our friends in the natural have a tendency to let us down. The best friend, well, one of Tiffany's best friend is me. Is, is that right? Okay. <laughs> I was wondering after yesterday. But you know something? There's times that I fail Tiffany. I do. I say something stupid. <laughs> and like, no duh. <laughs> Listen today. <laughs> but I say something, I'll say something. I'll, I'll miss, I'll miss a, 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 a signal that I'm supposed to get. Because <laughs> men are brain damaged. <laughs> that doesn't give, a, give us a right to stay brain damaged. But the point is, is we, we miss it. I fail her. I don't mean to. I don't do it maliciously. I don't do it so that I can hurt her. Just sometimes in my own ignorance and my own selfishness and my own ego, whatever it may be, I fail her. But I thank God that she doesn't stand up and go, yeah, and you should have heard what he said. She could. But she loves me. We'll go to that concert, okay? No. <laughs> uh, she loves me. She's loyal to me. Hey, she's been married to me for almost 26 years. Goodness gracious, folks. No, it has been 26 years. Almost 27 years. <laughs> Listen, anybody to put up with this. My mama wouldn't even keep me that long. <laughs> but our friends, we have a tendency to let each other down because we're all human and we all fail. And that puts me back to the reason we need number one is because the reason that we need a relationship with Christ because He will always fulfill these things, these characteristics, even when our friends let us down. Amen. Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Amen. You say, yeah, but Jesus, what about this time? Oh, no, I was with you then. I carried you through that moment. Yeah, but what about him? He, what about this situation? Yeah, I walked right alongside of you. Right. Yeah, but what? No, he's always with us. Yes. He's the friend that sits closer than a brother. Yes. And that's the reason we need a relationship with Christ. See, understand something this morning. You and I were created for relationship. Do yes. you get that? We were created out of relationship for relationship. When God said, let us make man in our image, it was out of whose image? It was out of the relationship of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And he created us out of that. And then God in his infinite wisdom <laughs> created woman. Because God said it's not good for man to be alone. We need relationships. We were created for relationship. First of all, it's that, it's that um, uh, vertical, that relationship between us and God. And then secondly is that relationship, the horizontal between us and man. We were created for relationship. The other thing that I want us to, to see in regards to that is, is that when we start talking about relationships, our relationships help shape our lives. Chaplain, uh, chaplain by the name of Ronnie um, Melancon, and I may say that wrong, but he made this statement. He says, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. 1 Corinthians 15.33 says it like this. In, in King James it says, bad company corrupts good morals. 
So listen, show me your relationships. Show me who those, those people that are talking to you, those people that are, that are your closest and dearest. And I'm going to tell you something. They will be the ones that help shape your life. Another thing about relationships, it takes time and it takes effort. Amen. You have to spend a little bit of time doing this. You can't just think, well, I'll just show up on Sunday. Hey, it's like, you're, it's like following Jesus. Well, I'm going to just show up on Sunday and that's all I'm going to do. Well, you're going to have a very immature relationship. Because on Monday through Saturday, life really does happen. And if you're not connected. So relationships take time to develop. I would say this to you this, way, this morning. Be more concerned about how you're developing as a friend than just the benefits that you're going to get from that friendship. See, a lot of times we talk about, well, well, I'll let them be my friend because they've got this, 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 and this. And sometimes friends are that way. I, I recognize that. But sometimes those true relationships have nothing to do with me as much as it has to do with them. How can I be a benefit and a blessing to them? And let that be my concern. And then let, Lord, let the Lord then begin to reciprocate that back. Yes, that's right. The Bible tells us what we reap will also sow. Or excuse me, what we sow will also reap. So the reason we need friends or the reason we need a true friend is because God uses them to help us to become all we can be. So we need a relationship with Christ and with the church and with true friends. The fourth relationship we need is this. Someone who is lost and hurting. Well, Pastor Scott, you always talk about that. Well, Luke 19.10 says this, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. The whole purpose for Christ to come was to seek and to save that which was lost and hurting. So if we are a follower of Christ, wouldn't that, why wouldn't that be the same purpose of our life? Jesus would say, as recorded in Mark chapter 2, verse 17, when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So why do we need to have a relationship? Why do we need to have a relationship with those people that are lost? Because we become the conduit. We become the bridge for them to see Christ and to come to Christ. And so the four relationships we need is Christ first and foremost. Listen, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, today's the day. Don't walk out those doors and say, well, I'll do it later. You're not guaranteed the next breath. And I don't say that to scare you. Listen, hey, because if I can scare you in, then the devil can scare you out. Um, but our greatest relationship that we need is with Christ. Then we need the church. Why do we need the church? Because the church is going to help us become all God wants us to be as, as well as a true friend. But then we, the fourth relationship that we need is with the lost. Why? Well, I'm going to just say it like this. And, and if you've been around here long enough, you've heard this. And because this to me is... This to me is, uh, when, when I got the revelation or understanding of this, it just became, it became part of me. Because you are blessed to be a blessing. That's why you need people that are lost. God told Abraham, you're going to be a blessing to all the world. Hallelujah. Now go to Galatians chapter 3 verse 29 and it says this, that if you are in Christ, then you are Abraham's seed according to the promise an heir according to the promise. So what's the promise? Blessed to be a blessing. So you and I are blessed to be a blessing. Why? So that we can bless not only just our, our, our close-knit friends, but those people that are lost and need to know Christ. And so this morning, I would ask you this. Evaluate your relationships. Listen, I realize that not all relationships are true friendships. In other words, that you're, we're best buddies, we're blood buddies. I, I understand that. Some of us are just acquaintances. That's okay. That doesn't mean we have to be mean. And, you know, but, well, I'm not Pastor Scott's best buddy. I guess I can't go to church. No, that's not what that is. Grow up. We're not in the fifth grade anymore. You know, Jesus had, he chose 12, but there was three that he was the most close to. And some people go, well, they're just clicky. Jesus had a click. He did. Peter, James, and John. 
The problem where a clique is, and listen, we don't want to be a clicky church, if you understand. Because you know what? The thing about Peter, James, and John, they were still inclusive. They didn't exclude. That's when a, a click is bad, is when you exclude. Well, you can't be in, you can't be in the bald club. Well, no, I can't because I'm not shaving my head. Huh. You can't be in the hair club. <laughs> but see, we're in, we're in the club. We're in the man club, bro. <laughs> Which is sometimes a good club, sometimes a bad club. Uh, but the point is, is, is right, we're, uh, uh, we're not clicky if we're being inclusive. A click is bad when it's exclusive. We can't be, belong to us because you don't. No, listen, as the body of Christ, we ought to be inclusive, all those people that we come in contact with. And we're going to develop our relationships, one, so that they're a blessing, not only to us, but more importantly to them. And we're going to, be, we're going to develop relationships so we can be a blessing to those people that are on the outside as well. That doesn't mean that I become like them. That doesn't mean I'm going to go to the bar and start drinking with them. So, well, I'm going to be a buddy of this. No, 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 no. Jesus never went and got drunk so he could be a, sin, uh, a friend to the, to the drunkard. He never went and found a prostitute so he could be a friend to the prostitutes. Well, we got to be relevant. That's not relevant. That's stupidity. That's ignorance. And so this morning, as we talk about being, you've got a friend in us. Let that be said of the Destiny Center. I, I, I like going to that place. I, there's a few friends there. Why? Because I believe that God's calling us. Not only to be his friends, but to be friends to those people that we come in contact with. Yeah, yeah, right. Father, I just thank you for this day. Lord, I pray that your spirit, oh, Lord, would you, your spirit today, Lord, take these thoughts, these ramblings, Lord, and just take them and help us, encourage us, strengthen us. Lord, help us to be better friends. In your precious name. One of the things in talking about relationships is next Sunday, in your bulletin, you're going to find this sheet. Next Sunday, we're beginning our fall community groups. We're starting a little late because of the way the schedule worked this fall. Um, but next Sunday, we're beginning our fall community groups. You can go on here, you can see those that are leading and where they're going to be led. Your, I'll just tell you this. Your leader or your community group leader will be contacting you this week. If you don't get contacted this week, please contact the church office. Karen, wave your hand. Well, they can't see you. But anyway, Karen Fox who helps, helps, helps us to coordinate our small groups, our community groups, she'll get you on. We want all of you to be participating. Some of you aren't maybe in particular one because um, we didn't have your name or something like that, but we want everybody. Why? Because we're trying to help de develop relationships. Why? So that we can help you be better in Christ, be better in your relationship with Christ, so that you can grow and mature. Listen, you know, one of, part of the thing is this. We want you to have fun. Amen. No, you're not just going to sit down and read the Bible for 24 hours. No, we're talking, uh, that, there's nothing wrong with that. You can do that. But the thing is, is our community groups are about developing relationship, having fellowship with, with, with other believers, and then having an opportunity to, to have a, a bridge into our community. And so we want you to be involved. And if you're here, well, I don't like that. Well, Jesus help them. Mm -hmm. I'll put a smile on. Jesus, you know who they are. <laughs> Go get them. <laughs> um, and so uh, we want you to be involved in those things. So please be aware of that. That's, that takes place next Sunday.